Welcome to this month's installment of the Intentional Success Webinar Series. We're going to talk today about the things we should have learned in the past hmm, 13 or so months during our pandemic do-over. So 2020 gave us a lot of new ideas and a lot of new answers about how to run our business well, how to adapt to the changing environment, how to take advantage of our strategic pivots um, to uh, not only sustain our businesses, but map a, a future for us post-pandemic, because uh, it's going to be a long road back. If we ever get back to what normal used to be, um, we can't see it from here. But instead, we're going to be doing some other really cool stuff in combination with the old stuff. And we need to understand what that is. And we under understand how to do business in that world. So I'm excited to talk about all of that today. Now, if um, there's always new people on these things, so let me remind you, I'm Tom Stimson. I'm your host. Um, I, I'm a business consultant. I work primarily in the live event space, um, which is everything from those of you who deliver services up through the manufacturing channels and dis distribution and everything in between. Um, I work with production people and hardware people. It's, if it's, if it's going to show up on a live event, whether it's content people or persons, um, I have clients that work in, in that space. So I share with you what I know and what I think will help you move your business forward. So thank you all for being with me today. Now, if you've heard me before, you've heard me say this before, W. Edwards Deming is by far, um, I think the greatest mind in business. He is my go-to read uh, when I'm trying to understand process. And I love this quote, 94% of problems in business are systems driven and only 6% are people driven. Interestingly enough, the reverse of that is true in my business. 94% of the problems that owners call me about seem to stem from people, even though there are systems behind that. And only 6% of the time that they call me and say, I don't think our processes are up to snuff. Um, I agree with Deming. Um, a lot of what I encounter in my clientele are um, whatever dysfunctions they may have in personnel are driven by systems that have not kept a pace with the demands of the business, the demands of customers, um, what you need to know to do the business well, and certainly the demands of the people who use the system. All of that changes and evolves. It has to keep changing and evolving or it will break. And that's where I come in. So um, near and dear to my heart. Now, this pandemic, this, this thing we've been all living through and continue to live through, should have triggered some pretty big changes in every business system you have. I wanna go over what I think are the 10 most important things that we should have fundamentally changed in how we do business in the live event space. You ready? All right, hi new people, thank you for being here. Let me tell everyone, this is being recorded. Double check, yes. This is being recorded. Um, it will get posted after this is done. You will get an email that sends you to the link so that you can watch the replay and share it with others. Um, if you have questions, any question at all, whether it's on or off topic, post it in the Q&A box. I will get to the questions. If you have comments or questions for your attendee, uh, the other attendees, post it in the chat. Say hello to your friends. Um, I love to see a shout out where you're from. Hello, Argentina. Hello, Scotland, um, uh, Arizona. Bring it on. Let us know where you're from because um, we're all one big family here. So let us know where you're calling from. I'm going to give you an update. I did this last month. I do this every month, but I'm, I'm following the same format because the updates are coming not quite as quickly, not as a big a deal from month to month. So pandemic business update month 13. We're about, we're, we're starting month 14. So through month 13, here are some of the observations that I have. I gave you this slide last month. I've only changed one thing in it, and that's what's going on during this current quarter. Uh, we are still getting a lot of mixed signals July through August. Many of you are telling me that you're very busy in May, but then when we look at the dollar numbers, it doesn't look that busy. You're doing some graduations, you're doing some outdoor events. <laughs> I've, my clients in Ohio did outdoor events last week. This week they're having to indoors because it's snowing again. 
Um, it's It's been kind of a wild ride. Um, embrace it. You have a limited amount of capacity. You need to know that. You need to fill your capacity if you don't feel that you have enough demand for that time period. Um, but there's also a, a point in time where you can't do anymore. The number one question I'm getting right now is, when should I bring my people back? Well, you don't bring your people back in the way that you're asking because you have a busy month. You start adding people back in because you have consistently high demand and into your forecast for months to come. And it is financially more viable to have a full-time person available than to outsource or use part-time on-demand labor, potentially at a higher hourly rate. So it's uh, we're still on that bumpy ride, but we're starting to see, it's like that roller coaster, you know? We're, 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 we're going up the tracks and we know when we get over the top, it's gonna start twisting and going fast and it's gonna be a wild ride. And we can't wait for that part. That's what we're waiting for. Um, and I'm sorry to say, it's probably not gonna be Q3 when that happens. Um, Q3 is just gonna be that first little hill that gets you warmed up. Um, it's gonna start a little bit slow, I still believe, but as Q4 starts to fill up with events, the lack of capacity, when, have, when was the last time we had a lack of capacity in our industry? The lack of capacity is going to start pushing events earlier. So people who want to get an event done this year might have to push it back into September um, in order to accomplish that. So pay attention to that. Um, Q4, yeah, there are some major events that are going to be in-person, hybrid, streaming events, the full package. Um, it's going to be exciting. People are going to post pictures of it. Um, it's going to be the talk of the town. And it's going to feel really, really good. Uh, we're going to see travel start to ramp up. But we're also going to see that this is going to be very painful because we haven't done this for a long time. So be aware of that. Um, cut yourself some slack that you're going to have to remember how to do some things. And you're going to have to adapt what you used to do to the new processes and the new customers that you have now. 2022, I'm going to say this probably from now until the February of next year, um, 2022 is a different year. And I want you to start thinking about it differently. When you talk to clients about jobs in 2022, I want you to be more certain about what you're saying, about what they're going to be able to do. We still can't predict, you know, whether we're going to have in-person or not in 2021. But by 2022, most of my listeners will be in a position to say, yes, we should absolutely plan on doing the in-person portion, um, maybe with some distancing, but in person and help your clients do better planning, be more confident. In 2021, we're still hedging. We're, we're still making our best recommendations. We're still saying we need to plan on streaming. We need to plan on hybrid. Uh, we can't solely plan on having just an in-person event. They need a plan B. Uh, but I think by 2022, we can start following our client's lead and get behind their idea of where they're going to draw the line or whether it's in-person or not. So those are my, my predictions. Um, my recommendations, therefore, um, you need a post-pandemic sales strategy. We are not post-pandemic yet. Uh, by no stretch of the imagination. We are still smack in the middle of this stupid thing. But we need to start thinking about what is our business going to look like afterwards? What parts of what we've learned and adapted are we going to keep? Uh, what parts are from the old world, the old <laughs> real life, are we going to bring back? And more importantly, how are we going to sell that? How are we going to acquire those customers and onboard them and serve them and keep them? Okay. Your sales processes have taken a huge hit because your staff has been diminished. You know, we're back to that startup mode where you've got five or eight people in your business. All of you are wearing five different hats and you're getting the work done, but you're also running out of capacity when you're busy. Get the process sorted out, get people in the right seats, get the right hat on them, um, start eliminating overlaps. In, in, in processes where the same person has to do three critical processes at the same time. Start thinking about those things. That's where you need to bring in personnel. That's where you need to get some help. That's when you need to buy more tools, 
um, to, to make your processes work better. Um, your delivery process. Right now, your delivery process is probably intertwined with your sales process. It's the same people. Again, you have a limited staff. Um, but as you start adding in-person events, that staff is all of a sudden going to be tied up on a show site when before they might have been tied up on a virtual show site. And many times they were multitasking <laughs> while they were doing that. We're not going to have that luxury as we're setting up outdoor events um, with even if there's a streaming portion of it. So start thinking about how you're going to keep from tying up your process leaders with being on jobs, being in show positions where they can't serve the process, can't serve the other jobs. So we've got to start stop uh, start reducing the shortcuts that we're taking in process to accommodate our limited staff and think a little bit more long-term. And then finally, get help with the above. Uh, this is, I talk about these things because this is all I've been doing with my clients for the past six months is helping them redefine what their business is going to be like in the post pandemic, which means that we have to redefine how it works right now. So keep up with that. If you need help with it, um, we're, and I'm doing, you know, three and six month engagements for people who need to put a little bit of a shine or polish on their processes to get them going. If that'll get you going and get you on down the road, I'm happy to talk to you about that. Um, so having said that segue, Hey, um, schedule a call with me. So if you're the owner or principal of the business and you want to talk about processes and the things that you need to do to get ready for what comes next, let's at least have a chat about it. See if we're a good fit. See if I can help you with any of that. Um, while you're looking at that and trying to figure out how to use the QR reader on your phone, I'll answer this question. It says, do you recommend taking new debt at the end of the year so that you're the one with the newest gear next year? It's a fantastic question. As the veteran of three major recessions in this industry, uh, two of which have been in this century, uh, so make that four major recessions, um, no, 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 no. First of all, there is not any new technology. Uh, manufacturing stopped, R&D stopped. Um, it's gonna take 18 months for that to ramp back up again. Yeah, there's a little bit out there. There's probably some things that you need. I had a chat with a client about, you know, adding a certain kind of LED to his product list because of the work that they're doing in studios. But other than that, most of you have way more gear than you need. The marketplace is full of it. And hold on to your seats rental prices are going to plummet. They're going to go up first, probably in Q4, but then they're, they're going to come crashing down because there is an oversupply in the industry. So no, I would be very careful and strategic about the new gear that I buy and make sure that it's going to fit your sales plan, your, your business strategy on what you're going to do going forward. So it's probably going to be, you know, maybe a 10th of what you would have spent uh, pre-pandemic. But as each year goes by or each six months go by, we always reassess that decision, decide when we need to make bigger investments. So thank you. Thank you for that question. It was a good one. All right. On to this webinar. So why, why this webinar? Why do we want to revisit all this? Again, like I said, um, Intentional Success Network um, has all of the videos from last year. Go check them out. You can watch them all again. A lot has changed and a lot has happened as we thought it would. So uh, price, value, availability, relationships with clients, relationships with workers, all of this has changed pretty dramatically in the past year. Um, our pre-pandemic model, as I've been very vocal about, was already broken. We had way too much supply, okay, which was driving prices down. The demand was good, we were all going to have the best year ever in 2020, but our prices and margins were slipping because there was too much redundancy in our marketplace. Too many com companies had the same equipment, the same talent, the same talent pool sometimes, then there was enough jobs to work it on. So we're all fighting for the, the scraps of the business and you end up competing on price. Um, I don't want us to go back to that. I want us to recognize where value is generated it is not in having excess capacity in inventory because that's what drive prices down. And always I, I'm looking at reducing risk. So how can I reduce the risk of being successful in your business? 
Um, what's the sales strategy? What's going to keep you in your lane so that you don't get off into a territory where you might not be as successful? All of that's very important to me because I want you guys to get used to winning and get used to winning again at a much higher profit rate, much more um, strategic growth rather than reactive growth. And ultimately let your business do for you what you've always wanted it to do for you. So this webinar is to pull back the pieces of the do-over list. Remember the do-over. I said, guys, we got a do-over, right? We're, we're right out of the movie City Slickers, you know? Yeah, you get to do this thing over. You can rebuild your business and undo the mistakes of the past, undo the systems and the processes and the kingdoms and the silos that you built. And, and the, the habits, the things we taught our customers to do, how, how we taught them to pay us slowly. We taught them to argue about pricing. We taught them to negotiate our prices down. Um, we taught them um, that we would over deliver at the drop of a hat. <laughs> we, can un we, can, we don't have to do that anymore. It's awesome. So here's the list. I'm gonna go through each of these um, in a little bit of detail. Um, we're gonna talk about deposits and terms which exactly a year ago was the biggest topic we had. You know, everybody was asking, all your clients were asking for their deposits back and you didn't have the money. Uh, guess what? Uh, you should never, ever um, accept a non-refundable deposit ever again. You should, every deposit should be fully um, uh, recognized as true revenue against services provided. Um, I'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Forecasting. How do you forecast in, in this hot mess that we're in? Well, that's the point. Um, you can always forecast. You may not like what the forecast tells you. So we need to be better at forecasting. It is absolutely foundational to running a healthy business. Keeping overhead down. Pre-pandemic, we used overhead to support. Now overhead is pulling us down. So we wanna keep our overhead low. We wanna stop putting in infrastructure to hold up costs of goods sold so that we could sell at a lower margin because it's covered by overhead. That's just crazy. So let's talk about keeping overhead down. Um, we learned that not all revenue is equal. Suddenly, you know, you, you, you set up this studio, you put all the switching camera and audio gear in it, you add up all the rental prices and you can't understand why the client wouldn't pay you $20,000 a day for your studio because if we were in a ballroom in Orlando, it would have cost them 80,000. Guess what? That's not where the value was. The value was not on your equipment. That's not what the revenue was paying for. So we've learned a lot about what revenue uh, is tied to this past year. Um, supply demand. Oh boy, have we learned a lot about supply and demand. I'm going to talk about that some more. Some of you have learned how to say no which is fantastic. Um, get used to saying no. Uh, you don't have to say yes to every client request. You don't have to say yes to every job. You don't have to chase every bit of revenue that happens to come your way. You need to have a well-developed no that will allow your yeses to be more valuable. Uh, marketing is not optional. Surprise, I would say that. Um, but it's not. Uh, marketing has been the thing that has saved those of us who have found a way to survive in this past year it's all tied back to marketing, okay? If you already had marketing in place and you made the adjustments in your marketing to deal with the current situation, you have done better, okay? So we've got to learn from that. Marketing is not optional going forward. Inventory, however, is to the question that I got earlier um, because inventory is everywhere. It is in ready supply. Um, there may be bits and bobs that are unique to um um, virtual events that are hard to come by. Don't worry about that. The stuff that you're worried about needing in the next six to 12 months is everywhere. It is stacked up in warehouses, holding down shelves, holding up dust. You'll have no trouble finding any of it. Um, getting new inventory is very much optional. Employees are a choice. Okay? You can run a business that uses more employees and you can run a business that uses less employees. You decide how, what kind of business you want to run. Okay. It will work both ways within limits. So we need to be paying more attention about that. We don't necessarily need to have a bunch of full-time 
employees that we pay for downtime. Um, we can have a much more on-demand workforce where we are still paying a good wage, where somebody can make a living working 32 hours a week on demand. This is how the retail industry works. This is how the restaurant industry works. Um, you can make a good living. We don't have to make people live uh, poorly to have the good help that we need. So uh, we need to look at employment differently. So let me walk through each one of these. I am sure I will, I'm sure this is gonna generate some questions and a few comments and the uh, probably the occasional nasty email. But um, I'm just sharing honestly with you what I think um, we need to pay attention to. <sighs> Deposits, terms and conditions. Okay, we learned very quickly last year that 80% of a virtual event happens before the event ever happens. Maybe it's 90% all that pre-production. We were no longer doing a show where you, the client confirmed you know, six weeks out and then five weeks later you checked in and then you showed up and did the show. No, they confirmed five weeks out and the next day you're having meetings, you're creating content, you're, you're, you're recording stuff, you're editing, you're previewing, you're re-editing, you're doing changes. And it was nonstop right up to the show and the show seemed easy, right? Right. We need to get paid for that preparation, planning, and production. That's what our deposits, and they're not really deposits, they're payments for the progress work that is being done. Um, refundable deposits should be a, a thing of the past. Um, there's really nothing that you should ask for a deposit for anymore that is refundable. There are, are exceptions to this. Nothing I say is ever absolute, but in general, all of your deposits should pay for services that are activated by confirmation. Um, slow pay, do not accept slow pay. Uh, the wonderful thing, one of the, I was talking with a, one of my clients yesterday, one of the cool things that they've noticed um, in the pandemic is the clientele they have now doing streaming events is much more willing to pay, much more willing to tell them what their budget is than the clients they were dealing with on RFP work uh, pre-pandemic. Um, and those RFP clients were notoriously slow pay. And these clients that are asking for, you know, giving you the budget and saying, what can we get done for this? Um, they may be high maintenance clients, but they're not slow pay. Don't accept slow pay. Okay. Um, reservations have value. If somebody's reserving your services, that's what the deposit is paying for. That has value. Okay? If they say, okay, well, we want to book you and your studio and your team. We don't have any pre-production, but we want to reserve this. Bam. Okay, there's an, there's an invoice, there's a reservation fee. Um, I mean, if anybody has planned a wedding knows that you've paid for the venue in full before you've paid for anything else. Okay, uh, reservations have a lot of value. Scarcity also increases value, okay? Um, having a limit, you know, you're basically a hotel, right? You're a venue, you run out of space. Yes, we can put it in someplace else and we can reproduce it somewhere else. Um, but your physical um, accoutrements have, are scarce, but then so is your talent. So we don't have unlimited talent. Our, your project managers, your producers can only handle so many projects at the same time. And it's, it's much easier to sell scarcity than it was pre-pandemic when all of your competition had excess capacity. They're also struggling with scarcity as well. And if we all leverage it, um, that's going to help keep your prices up, get your deposits in, get your confirmations earlier, all the things that you value. Ah, uh, forecasting. So, oh, and I probably said this about many other things, but right now this is what I believe is that this is the number one most important management skill you can develop is the ability to forecast reliably. You may not forecast happily always, but you need to forecast reliably, reliably because everything hinges on your forecast. And if you lie to yourself in your forecast, you're gonna make bad decisions. Um, if you hedge your forecast, you're gonna miss opportunities. Um, forecasting does a lot of great things for you. One, it, it predicts demand on cash. The last year, uh, you know, everybody's cash flow was incredibly tight. We're trying to string out, add days at a time onto our cash flow plan. Um, forecasting helped us do that. Um, it tells us when we can and should hire people, when we should book resources, 
when we may one day buy new equipment. So forecasting really matters in that. It affects pricing and terms. Knowing right now that you're probably going to be busy in September and you have a couple of jobs already booked and you've hit your break-even mark for that month should automatically increase your pricing on any, any future jobs. Um, you're going to have overlapping demand on your resources. It's worth more to you. Um, therefore, you should sell it at a higher price. And oh, by the way, you're getting a little bit scarce. You know, forecasting tells you when it's time to be brave with your pricing. Um, you can forecast, if you think about your sales funnel, you can forecast all of it. You can forecast an, an increase in leads, an increase in prospects, an increase in opportunities, and each one forecasts the others. Um, if our opportunities increase, our sold business is gonna, going to increase. So pay attention to what's going on in your sales funnel because it's going to give you forecasting clues. And then once you have a forecast, please share it. <laughs> I mean, you need to communicate this. Sales operations and finance all need this data to do their jobs better. Um, they need to know when they should be urgent um, and when they should be diligent, um, when they are scarce and when they are plentiful, uh, when are there are going to be demands on cash, when is there going to be an excess capacity that we could sell? All of this matters to folks. Forecasting pretty much dictates everything. Oh, overhead expenses. Well, here's something I would never have say, said before the pandemic is you should have no unprofitable months. Go back. Think about all the years that you've done this. For those of you who are production rental companies, rental staging companies, you had six good months, you had two so-so months, and you had four bad months, uh, two months of which lost a ton of money. But the average company probably only had six profitable months. Okay? The reason is, is they had too much overhead. Okay? They had overhead for busy season instead of having overhead for slow season. So in order to have no unprofitable months, your overhead you know, shouldn't be holding up operations. Your overhead should be down low so that even in a slow month, you can break even, okay? You're gonna wanna make exceptions <laughs> to this rule, okay? Make some really smart choices when you're doing this. You may decide that, you know, even though December is really bad, you've got a lot of work starting in the first half of the year and you're gonna bring on some new staff in December and that month's gonna look bad. Okay, that's a strategic choice. It could very well be a smart one. It needs to be a conscious choice. Now, the ramifications of reduced overhead and reducing your overhead capacity is that you might take less work in busy months. Your busy months won't be as busy, okay? Your slow months won't be as unprofitable, so it's kind of a nice trade-off. Um, you will outsource more. You will hire seasonally more. Um, you'll be more selective about what roles your management is in and where they're involved. And that's going to change in busy months and slow months. Uh, you'll find management doing more hands-on work in slow months than you will in busy months. So all of these things come together. Um, I'll pause here for a question. Uh, any tips or pointers to forecast more closely over the next three to 12 months. I find it currently a struggle to get an accurate read considering the short-term business and continuing cancellations. Um, tips or pointers. First of all, one is trust your gut, okay? The, all the cancellations are telling you something. Um, you know, it's a lovely spring day. It was really cold here last night. I thought, okay, I'm gonna open up my window so that I can have some nice cool air while I'm visiting. And here we are, I've got a mower outside my window, stand by. Ta -da. So um, tips on forecasting. Um, when I'm looking at the jobs that I have in my pipeline, I'm looking at once, what's the frequency of the inquiries that I'm having, okay? Well, how many of those generally manifest into projects versus becoming dead ends? And then once I get to an opportunity where I'm, I'm starting to look at the 50-50-ness of this, um, how good am I at motivating clients to make a closing decision or if I'm waiting? So you're not going to have a good forecast if you are not pushing your clients to a closing decision. A no is more valuable to you than I have no idea what they're going to do, 
right? I always say I'm not trying to win yeses when I'm closing business. I'm trying to I'm trying to identify the no's. The sooner you get a no from a client, the better. Therefore, in my forecasting system, in my budgeting system for forecasts, I look at a business which is active um, but not closed as as a 50% probability at best. I don't recognize anything below 50%, okay? And in order to be 50%, the client has to be engaged. We have to have done at least a round of changes and they have to be returning my phone calls or my emails. If I don't meet those criteria, that job just dropped to zero on my probability forecast. I'd rather go into a month with no business um, instead of preparing for business, which is probably gonna cause me to be reluctant to quote on other things that overlap. So you, you've asked this question at the worst possible time because there's never been a more difficult time to forecast than there is right now, but apply some of those tips to the things that you're looking at. Discount things that aren't 50% or better, discount them to zero in terms of whether or not they fit into your forecast, not your price. Um, and do push for closing. Do put hard deadlines on things. And if the client misses that deadline, send them the flight. Thank you. Say our capacity has been given to somebody else, but we look forward to working with you in the future. So there. Um, I hope that helped you a little bit in that question. So we talked about overhead. Now we're going to talk about um, revenue, qualifying revenue. It's been interesting because uh, a year ago, you uh, the people were complaining. It's got, yeah, man. We're doing these Zoom assists and, you know, some of them are only $5,000. And now I'm going, oh, man, great. Yeah, we're doing these platform shows. Um, it, we got this one client, they're doing 5000 a week. The, the whole idea of what that revenue meant um, has changed dramatically in a year. All of a sudden, those $5,000 jobs are just like gold, um, which has been interesting to watch. But the thing is, they are gold. Uh, now, some things to remember. Smaller transaction revenue doesn't necessarily mean small profit. The smaller the job, the higher the profit margin you should expect. Um, if I if I can get uh, if I can do a five thousand dollar you know Zoom enhancement, um, I you know I might be expecting seventy or eighty percent gross profit on that job. If I'm doing a fifty thousand dollar enhancement, I'm not going to get 70, 80 percent gross profit. I'd probably be thrilled with 50 or 60. So look at the amount of the revenue and make sure that the risk inherent with it and the profit follow each other. Um, surfaces, services that require personnel to work in a real-time schedule should be the most profitable. If there's a fixed point in time where I have to have a crew and a studio and a control room engage for eight hours on this particular date, that is 10 times more valuable then um, we need to capture 10 hours of video over the next three weeks. You see the difference? So if, if I, you know, I always talk about this in, in, in salesman terms, if you tell operations that the delivery has to be at 8 a.m., operations is going to spend more money to get it there at 8 a.m. than if you had said, we need it delivered by 8 a.m. or we need it, need it, need it delivered between 7 a.m. and 9 Okay. Time is money. Specificity is very expensive. Um, rental businesses. We have flipped our labor to revenue formulas. Um, uh, 18 months ago, I would have been advising you to get your labor rates and your discount structure up so that a major $100,000 event, you had $40,000 of labor and $60,000 of equipment. Um, today, if you had a hundred thousand dollar show, um, I expect the client to be paying you, oh, probably eighty thousand dollars in labor and services, and maybe twenty thousand dollars in reservations. Um, very, very different formula in this, and we can maintain this going forward, even doing an in-person live event. If you put the value on the personnel and the the intellect that it takes to put on the show, and even if in your mind, if you're a rental person, you're going, you mean I have to discount the equipment? I don't want to get on a soapbox, but your, your equipment pricing have never had any meaning. You weren't discounting equipment. You were just moving your retail price around 
um, as circumstances allowed or required. Um, there is no such thing as a rental price list. Um, it's whatever you're going to get for it. So um, let go of your idea that your pricing, your rental pricing pre-pandemic actually meant anything. Look at the value, look at what it's worth to the customer now. They don't care what your equipment is, they only care what it does. And going forward, that's gonna carry forward with the exception of, of a few commodity buyers, which some of you are still gonna deal with. Um, always, when you focus on deliverables um, instead of buyables, then you can raise the minimums that you charge. Um, you know, We may have had a $500 rental minimum but my, uh, um, but I can have a twenty-five hundred dollars service minimum. So look at how you charge and what you're willing to say no to. A five hundred dollars rental sounds like pure profit, but right now in your current environment, getting getting somebody in, getting it prepped, getting it out the door, recovering it, dealing with their problems, all the profit went away the, the minute you touched that equipment. So think about a higher minimum before you get somebody into the warehouse dusting off that gear. Now, revenue is one thing, value is another. We've learned a lot during our do-over about how to reassess value. Um, we've learned that clients are more important than customers. Clients are people who come to you with business whenever they need something that's in your sphere of work. Customers are people who will do transactions with you. And when the transaction's over, they go back to doing something else. And they have to recreate their, their relationship with you with every transaction. Even if you've been doing the same event year after year after year, and they only talk to you one time a year, that's a customer. That is not a client. A real client would have had things for you to do year round. Your clients, no matter who they are, have needs that are in your sphere of work year round. And if they are not asking you to do that, even if it's little things, if they're not asking you to do that, then you're dealing with a customer relationship. Nothing wrong with customers. Clients are more valuable. Clients will let you make more money. Um, we've also learned that people is more important than technology. And right now, technology is pretty much everywhere. Um, like I've said, collecting dust, um, but people are not. People are very hard to come by right now. It's very difficult to hire talent for the things that you need right now. Um, everybody's scrambling, looking for personnel. The, the employees that they used to have aren't necessarily gonna come back. Um, so all of a sudden people are more valuable. Outcomes are more important than transactions. If you can sell engagement in a streaming event, if you can make the two audiences in a hybrid event, both happy um, and engaged with what they saw, that's way more valuable then, then I could have bought this somewhere else for less money. And your customers know this. And availability is more important than price. Okay, anytime you find a price shopper, um, I would hit the pause button and say, let's first check and see if we have availability. And then we can talk about price, All right? So you have the lever, you have the power when you talk about um, availability. All right, I'm gonna talk about slide and apply and demand, but let me see what this question is. It says, our pre-pandemic forecasts were based on recurring trade show work, which was based on years of those shows taking place during the same time. Yep. Um, this year, all those shows have shifted dates. How can we predict forecast monthly revenues when there's no telling how future expo calendars will be arranged? You're just not gonna be able to predict it as many years in the future. Uh, you're still gonna be able to predict. You may not like what you're predicting is my point. Um, I believe that eventually, do you believe that eventually these recurring shows will find their ways back to their original times of year? Yeah, I think a lot of the trade show work will find its way back. Um, they are at that time of the year because that's an effective time of the year for their audience. Um, if NAB wants to be in the same week, it will be in the same week. CES gets to be in the same week. They have a huge amount of buying power. Those venues are not going to sell out from underneath them. So when they want those dates back, they're going to get those dates back. Um, but we don't know what's going to happen to the expo industry post pandemic. Um, so again, predicting revenue may be difficult. Um, we heard a lot of talk about limiting booth size, um, requiring virtual elements, recognizing that maybe 60% of an expo audience might be virtual going forward. Some things are going to change. The way we forecast revenue is we look at the opportunities that we have 
based on the timeline of those opportunities and what's the projected value of that. Anything after that is just guessing. So if we don't know when something is going to happen, it doesn't exist and we need to plan accordingly. And if that means that some of your months or quarters look really, really dismal, it's because the revenue that you're acquiring uh, manifests at a much, much later time than it did before. You can't forecast a year and a half out on an expo or a convention or an association meeting. Okay, You're now back to the six-week timeline that um, a lot of us have had to live with. And in some cases for smaller events, you know, we're inside of two weeks for a lot of things. So, sorry, probably not the answer you wanted to hear, but you do have data, use that data for forecasting wisely. And clearly I'm gonna to have to do a webinar on forecasting or another one, supply and demand. Well, when demand goes up and supply doesn't, the price is gonna go up, okay? The intersect of the supply demand curve is the price point. Um, low supply, more demand price goes up. High supply, low demand price goes down. For a fixed amount of demand, if there's more supply, the price goes down. We need to pay more attention to this. Um, you're in a seasonal industry. We've always been a seasonal industry. However, seasonality means less in a streaming world because it's much easier to do events year round when you're not dependent on whether or not the sun is shining um, at your venue. So think about everything always being seasonal, which means your pricing is always in flux. You do not have a fixed price. Um, a, this job in October costs X, it, the same job this July would cost Y. Um, next April, who knows, they may cost Z because timing all matters. Um, your seasons are not the same as your competitors, right? We all have different busy times. There are some of you out there who are always busy in Q1, and there are some of you out there who are never busy in Q1, and you can do the exact same things. You're just geographically or market-wise focused in different places. Um, so don't worry about what you're, I always say don't worry about your competitor, um, your competitor is living in a different season and they're struggling to understand their seasonality right now as well. Um, this all goes back to why the forecasting is so critical because forecasting is based on the data that we have and a little bit of gut, right? Um, prices don't matter. Costs and margins do. Here's the thing about pricing. I can set any price I want, but it doesn't change what my cost is. So in order to price effectively, if the supply demand curve drives prices down to the point where it approaches my cost, I need to stop selling because I will lose money. And we saw a lot of this in 2019. We saw many of you who were so busy in certain months and you had dropped your prices so dramatically at the wrong possible time that your costs were matching your income. And that big month turned out not to be very profitable. And I don't ever want to see you go back to doing that again. So um, now <laughs> customers that want to break down your pricing are comparison shopping. Uh, for those of you who are, are caught in the RFP grind with certain um, destination management companies that are trying to control the marketplace for their own nefarious good, um, they are price shoppers. And if they are insisting that you present your pricing in a way where they can negotiate individual items or compare you against someone else, um, they are comparison shopping and you need to decide if that's the business you wanna be in. My advice is be a really scarce for those people and pay attention to your seasonality. Um, don't listen to their promises is that we have work year round well, they do, they just don't necessarily have it for you. They have work year round for the low bidder. So unless it happens to be a month where you have a lot of capacity and you're willing to um, manage your costs on a job, um, stay away from price shoppers. Which is why we turn down work. Uh, pause for another question here. It says, um, Bill says, as the, calendar fills, as the calendar fills, is it better to just say no versus pricing high to nearly fully engage some contractors, but in turn risk becoming the expensive guy. I don't mind the expensive guy route as long as it weeds out less desirable business. 
helps us focus on better projects and keeps our name out there. So yeah, if I'm really busy, do I just raise my price? And if they bite, I figure I can figure out how to pull it off. There's a, there's a line that you cross that becomes gouging uh, where you're taking advantage of customers. And I'm, I hope, and I know, I know you, Bill, I know that's not what you're suggesting, but I want to caution other people to be aware of where that line is. Um, we're, this is the right question for the slide that we're on. Use your margins, use your availability and your scarcity, use the scope of work to determine what work you choose to pursue. Sometimes we don't, we say, hey, I can do this, but I'm raising the price. Maybe what I need to say is I can do that, but I have to do it this way to make it work. Or if you say, yes, I can do that at this price. And they say, well, we want to do it at this price. I said, I can't say yes to that price, but here's what I can do for that price. Okay. And we have this conversation differently between clients and customers. Clients, we're going to be a lot more accommodating to. Okay. They, we're not, they're not asking us to lose money, but they do want an honest feedback when you have to limit the scope to work inside their budget. Customers, on the other hand, you're typically dealing with a one-off job because the definition of a customer is you're renegotiating every job. Um, you're going to have to treat each job as a seasonal pricing opportunity and leverage that scarcity and be willing to say, you know, if I had 100% of your business 100% of the time and you gave me your budget 100% and you paid on time and you would work with us on getting the right solution for your budget, um, it'd be a heck of a lot easier to say yes right now. And that's honesty. And I think we could use a lot more of that being honest with ourselves. And now that your capacity is limited, there's a lot more motivation to turn down work that is not respecting your value, your availability, um, and the quality of your work. Thanks. Thank you for these questions. This has been wonderful. Marketing. All right, I'm not gonna dwell on this for too long. Uh, marketing will find you new customers while you sleep, okay? Um, marketing will prepare them in advance to expect you to be wonderful, right? So we don't have to do a lot. If our marketing is doing our job, we don't have to do a lot of convincing people how wonderful we are. They've reached out to you because they're already convinced how wonderful you are. How awesome is that, okay? Scare the rest away. Good marketing will turn some people around and send them running. That's what we wanted to do. We don't want to waste our time with people who are just shaking in the trees for, for value or, or low prices or who are buying something that you're not selling. Make sure that people understand what it is you do and who you wanna work with and that they can see themselves fitting in with you. Life's way too short for price shoppers. And the only way to get out of dealing with price shoppers is to have better marketing. All right. Inventory. I know I'm talking to a bunch of gearheads and I hate to tell you this, but you know it. You already have too much inventory. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about all the stuff you have. Hopefully you've sold off the things that are obsolete that you're not going to use. You probably should have gotten rid of them two years ago. Um, you're not getting much money for it, but you're getting more money than you were letting them sit on the shelf. Um, when you are slow, you're going to take less money for your idle resources and probably considerably less. Remember that there is a overabundance of inventory on the marketplace. Um, you've got to go wholesale or below very, very quickly if you want to move it off your shelf during a slow time. If you have a qualified renter, which is mostly going to be a B2B transaction, you know, a production company to production company, sub rental transaction, cross rental, um, go ahead and get below um, the wholesale prices that you know to exist. Um, take less money for the idle resources. You'll be, you'll be happier. Um, it'll, it'll work for you. Um, otherwise, for everybody else, for any B2C transactions, choose where you belong on the rental to services scale. Um, if you are production rental, you're still gonna have a lot of rental value in your budget and a little bit of services value. Uh, because what you are renting is a package to a specification with support, as opposed to being responsible for the outcome of the event, where you're seriously much more valuable. And 
if you have clients that buy from you as a production rental one day and a full service event company another day, all they remember is their production rental pricing. And now you're doing full service events at production rental pricing, figure out where you live, make the pricing match the services that you're providing. Uh, going forward, you're going to capitalize to the question I had earlier, you're going to capitalize at a much lower rate if you have recognized how valuable services are to you. If on the other hand, you are in the rental business and that is your primary focus, you're not really a, a delivery services company, you're not doing the event, you're supporting the people who are the event, um, you're still probably gonna capitalize at a lower rate than you have before, but I think you'll probably find you're gonna need to specialize a little bit more. Um, chances are you have plenty of inventory um, for the non-specialized things left over from pre-pandemic. My point is don't take it for granted, don't take um, the resurgence. Don't look at 2022 as the opportunity to go out and replace all your speakers and buy new LED walls and upgrade all of your cameras. Um, because I think the ROI you're going to get on those things are going to be so much less than what you're used to. The financial decision um, for a lot of those decisions is going to be negative. And then employees. Your, you know, your overhead should be the people it takes to acquire and service um, the customer, not deliver the project. That's direct labor. Um, we need to acquire labor. We need to acquire money. And that's that should be paid by your overhead expenses. Um, therefore, any, um, so secure revenue, manage processes and plan for execution. Everybody else is a direct cost. So when you have direct costs year round, you can add more employees year round, but many of you will not have direct costs year round. So keep those direct costs off the payroll and use them as incidental labor or on-demand payroll um, or outsource labor to do that. Um, it is your choice about how many employees you have. But again, if, our, if, our, if you understand the importance of keeping overhead down, um, then you'll understand the importance of having a seasonal workforce or, or an on-demand workforce, which we as an industry can afford a pretty big on-demand workforce if we eliminate all the redundancy in, in our employee, full-time employee payrolls. You know, in any given town where I have, and I have towns where I have multiple clients um, who are direct competitors, when one of them's busy, another one isn't. It's very rare that they're all equally busy where they're actually bringing in labor from outside of their region to support projects. The fact of the matter is there's just enough labor in most markets to service the work that's there, figure out how to use that more effectively, figure out how to share labor pools. Um, uh, you, that's not where you, you create value. You create value by providing the solution. You know, the, the people and the skills and the equipment that you hire are the talent you put together, but you need to know how to put together the right parts and pieces. That's what you're selling. So um, just a quick recap what we've talked about, and, and you've probably got some more questions and feel free to tee them up in the Q&A. Um, deposits and terms, better forecasting. We wanna keep our overhead down. Remember, not all revenue is equal. Um, your value right now is probably in services. Okay, rental's just a commodity. It's probably more commoditized than it's ever been in your, uh, your lives. Uh, pay attention to supply and demand. It fluctuates and it affects our pricing. It also affects our costs. Uh, learn how to turn down business. A really well-developed no is your best friend. Uh, marketing, figure out how to do it steadily. It doesn't take a lot of energy once you have it set up. Uh, you need to figure that piece out. Uh, inventory is optional. Um, other people can own inventory on your behalf. Um, employees are a choice. Um, whether or not you keep somebody around as a full-time employee is a choice that you make. Um, it, and the choice you might be making is that you're going to be unprofitable several months out of the year because of that decision. So be aware of all of that. All right. Um, do you have any more questions that you might have? Thanks, folks. Uh, we're uh, we're running out of time. Marketing, my book, Demand. Okay, how to build a smarter sales funnel so you can turn down better business. Um, great stuff in there. Very easy read, available on Amazon. Um, go check it out. Thanks for, uh, thanks for all of you who have uh, purchased copies. 
and downloaded. Um, again, if you're ready to grow and make some money, you're ready to figure out where your company needs to be post pandemic and how to set that all up, um, reach out to me. Let's have a conversation. Let's see if we can work together. Um, I'm, I'm having a lot of fun with the call, the many clients I'm working with right now that are going through all of this. So every client gives me more experience and more that I can share with you. I don't think I could be more valuable right now, um, but we're still priced pretty fairly. Next webinar, um, your team desperately needs to understand your strategy. I'm going to talk next time about how to have a strategy. If this is simply the, trust me, this is going to probably be the funnest webinar you've ever been for, been to just because it has the word strategy in it does not mean it is a snoozer. Um, this is a very simple process. I take all of my clients through. I'm going to share it with you so that you can try it out on yourself so that you can have a better chance of putting yourself in the right position to say no to the wrong business and probably yes to the right business. So, some summary. All right. Um, accept the right work. Don't accept the wrong work. Learn how to not accept the wrong work. Learn what the right work is and build your sales process around winning and accepting and delivering that work. Design a business that's based on the right work, not the work that you end up with. Um, putting in processes for things that you don't normally do is a waste of resources. It's a distraction. Um, sometimes you're going to take some weird revenue um, and that's okay. That doesn't need, mean that we need to change the, run our, the way we run our business to do that. Slow down. I want you to grow slowly and carefully coming out of this pandemic. We will have a go-go period again. It'll probably start in 2023. Um, but for the next year and a half, we need to grow slowly and carefully, make measured decisions, not get ahead of ourselves. It's very, very, very important. So um, I don't know that we'll have a lot of questions here since we're out of time and I know some of you need to go. But I do want to say, as always, thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, of course, this will be recorded. This will be posted, all that good stuff. Um, welcome to see your questions. Um, love to see you on the Intentional Success Network, uh, digging through the old stuff, um, commenting on the new blogs and things that go in there, um, catching up with each other. It's all good. So we're all in this together. Hang in there. A few more months, it'll start to feel a little bit less like the pandemic. Um, and I know we're all looking forward to that. So get your vaccine. I'll see you next month.